Welcome, welcome to Basketball Heads Live. I'm your host, Glenn Poo Harding. Tonight's guest, we got Eric Hicks, the CEO and founder of Game Over. Yes, the number one grassroots program in Brooklyn. Go and chop it up with them. But let you know, tonight's broadcast is sponsored by Styles by Nita and Unique Creations. Let's get it. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? ready? Yes. yes. You have you just have stepped, stepped into, into, into the, the world, world of chaos. chaos. Where everybody, Where everybody goes, goes hard. hard. Tickets because the game about to start. Hey, baby. Yeah. What's going on, man? All is good, man. How are you? How are you? I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. That's right. You got the you got the man doing the bounce. The Absolutely, game over. Man. That's right. That's right, man. Listen, man. I, I'm glad to have you. I uh, hope everything is well with you and your family. All is good, man. All is good. Let me just say that you having this forum and having this platform where you, where you can get these stories out. And various aspects of the game, man. Big shout out to you. Very proud of what you're doing, man. Uh, thank you, thank you, man. I, I just, you know, I, I've been knowing what you've been doing. Been hearing some good things about you, and a lot of people been saying, you know, that's a good brother, man. Thank you for having him on, man. It's a good brother from everyone I've been talking to. So salute to you, man. What you've been doing. Well, I, I appreciate that, man. And, and and nothing's out of bounds from business to basketball from. You know, um, whatever you want to ask, I got some answers. May hurt some feelings, but it is what it is, man. I'm at the hey, age man. where I don't care. <laughs> That's right, man. That's right. We either go hard or go home, right? Exactly, man. Go hard or go home. Basketball hey, head. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so what, what, what I saw, right, I, you know, I saw that you had a background in basketball. And this this is always interests me. You know, it even opens the conversation up a little bit more, right? Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. You know, just just having that 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 uniform on and playing in Atlantic Ten means a lot. So well, yeah, but let me tell you something. When I played, there wasn't even an Atlantic Ten. We were an independent. Wow. Now I'm gonna give you a quick a quick uh, storyline on my basketball career. All right, so I'm born in Harlem, raised okay. in Harlem. All right, moved to a okay. place called Colorado City. Well, in Harlem where I lived was Upper Harlem, 155th and Eighth Avenue. I right. lived in Colonial Projects, right? Uh -huh. Polo Grounds was right next door, but the Polo Grounds was a baseball stadium that was closed down. So those projects that uh -huh. are there now, a little kid, no, nah, we was running past a baseball stadium back then. That's wow. when they show that famous picture of, of Rucker Park where Dr. J and all of them was yeah. playing. Yeah. I yes. went by that park every day, man. Never even thought about touching a basketball. Matter of fact, I graduated from that school that that park was <laughs> I was going for wow. the world champion Skelly player, man. I didn't want to hear nothing about no basketball. I was playing the game. <laughs> that was what y'all know about Skelly, man? What y'all know about Yo, Skelly, man? <laughs> Skelly and punch ball, those were the things going on in the projects. The basketball dudes, okay. the old, older guys were playing basketball. Right, so right, I right. Walked by Dr. J and all of them and couldn't care less, man, because I was going right. to be a professional Skelly player. So, okay, okay. When I'm 10, I move up to Co-op City in the Bronx, okay? Now, Co-op City, everybody knows it has 35 buildings now, Bay Plaza, townhouses, 30-story buildings and everything. When I moved to Co-op City, there was two buildings open and one basketball. Right. And there was nothing else to do but go downstairs and try to play basketball by this, mm. on this basket right by my building. So I went out there like every day, man, every day going out to this park. It was... um. It was probably five black families in the two buildings, so nobody okay. was really playing. If he was playing something, he was playing hockey, and it was Co-op City was 99% Jewish, so I was the black kid walking around with a hockey stick, man. The only wow. one walking around with a hockey stick. But the basketball bug hit me in Co-op City, man, and then I just played every day. Now, now, what I learned from being in Brooklyn and Queens now is that 
what happens is you become part of a basketball culture. You have yes. a chance to yeah. thrive and become something. So when you move into a neighborhood, I was the culture. The oldest kids were 15. I was 10. Or the oldest kids right. were 13. I was 10. We had no basketball culture. There was no Ray Haskins. You know, there was no Ted Gustin. Mm. There was no, um, you know, you got a lot of legendary trainers. Uh, I'm trying to think right, of one right. that all we talk about in Brooklyn that I had the opportunity to meet. But we didn't have that culture. We were making it up as, as it went along. So, uh, you know, like, it was all about Walt Frazier, Earl Monroe, and Willis Reed. I knew nothing about college basketball. Not a thing mm. about college All I knew was that part, sneaking out every day at 6 o'clock in the morning, sneaking past my mother's room, rolling the ball first, and then I'd have to sneak behind the ball and then close that door really quickly and silently to get down to the park and practice. My mother would wake up 7, 30, 8 o'clock and look in the bed be like, where the hell is this boy? Then she'd come wow. over and she'd see me in the park playing basketball, trying to be Earl, trying to be Clyde. So um, fast forward, we got Truman High School, right? Truman High School, we were a brand new high school in uh, the Bronx, right? Brand new, beautiful high school. Imagine now, by the time Truman High School opened up, there were probably 25 buildings in Co-op City, 80,000 kids. When they had wow. trials, when they had trials for Truman High School basketball team, the it line was all <laughs> the Right, right. Gil Reynolds was the other name I was thinking about. Don't want to, don't want to. Gil miss Reynolds, Gil yeah, Reynolds. legendary coach. Yes, yeah, I learned a lot from him. Yes, legendary coach Gil Reynolds. So that y'all had that culture. We, I was the culture. We made it up. Okay, so right, Truman, right. You know, you, you, you go and you you try out. I couldn't play. I thought, you know, so, you know, in retrospect, that first year, I couldn't play. It cut me like they cut another 300 guys, and it was what it was. Then my senior year, went back and tried out, got cut again. And uh, it, it was devastating, devastating thing. But that day, and, and this is why I like to talk about the whole story of game over basketball and business. That day that I cut, I got cut, lit a fire in my ass that burns in me to this day. So instead wow. of getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Instead of taking the elevator in them buildings, I'm running the stairs three times a day, up and down the stairs. Mm. I'm just making it up. Co-op City had these huge sand pits for the kids to play yeah. in huge sandboxes. Yeah. I used to run in them sandboxes. Back then, we had weight jackets and ankle weights, probably the worst thing you could do. But yes. you know, yeah. Yeah. Even we did I'm making it up. I'm making it up. I'm making it up. By the time, and then the coach, when he cut me, he said, listen, you know, I can't keep you, blah, blah, blah. You're a senior, but I'd like you to be the manager, which kind of even hurt me. Well, I was like, I can be, I'm better than these dudes. Now I'm going to be the manager. They're going to be making fun of me, this, that, and the other. But then I knew that I would get to see the best players in the city for free. And I would go to every game and get an up-close look. And then maybe somebody would get hurt and I would get a chance or whatever. That didn't happen. But I got to see all the players in the city, you know, the Ty Ladsons, the Curtis Reddings, the Rolando Blackmans, those are your Brooklyn cats. Then we had Scooter McRae, Rodney McRae, you know, guys like that. You get to see those guys. Well, Scooter, Rodney was just a baby. But Scooter. Right, 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 right. right. And, and we had a guy out here named Artie Green also, and I used to go to all the tournaments, and I stole from everybody. Stole from everybody, man. Uh, there was a dude named Machito. Uh, his name is Angel Cruz. I don't know if you ever heard of Puerto Rican legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Machito. I mean, I used to watch these guys. The Whitney M. Whitney M. Young Memorial Tournament down in Harlem on 135th. Used to go down there where I saw Albert King versus Artie Green and stuff like that. And I was the guy sitting on the sideline, same age as them, but just studying everything, studying everything, and um, got to be a pretty decent player. So now when I'm walking around in school, people is like, yo, that dude right there, that dude, it just changes you, man. It changes you. It, it's, the analogy I use is like from being in the parks going from the last pick to the first pick. And right, see, what we right. do, like when we train kids now, we don't do that. We make the teams. Like coaches, all right, you on this team, you on this team, you on this team. In our gym, I'm like, no, y'all pick the size. And if you're the last pick, yo, live with it. What you going to do about it? You that's know, right. you always that's be right. the last pick, right. but you're going to put that's in the extra right. work to be the first pick. Because that's everybody's life. not going to get picked all the time. And that's life. That's, that's life, right. man. That's right. Yeah. that's right. But see, when we try to even things up, it's not realistic. It's not life. No. It's, not real. it's not realistic in life when they're going to even things up. You got to go out there and fight for what you want. I had to fight for everything on the court and in business. All right. So I wind up, like I said, I knew nothing about college basketball. The year I graduated from high school, 
St. Bonaventure University wins the NIT. I still never heard of St. Bonaventure. Now, they playing right now. You know back then, or you may not know. I'm a little older than you, but you know, the NIT was bigger than NCAA back then. Oh, yeah, and definitely, NIT, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I NIT remember that. come to the garden and play. So this yeah. little school wins the NIT. And I still, at that point, in June or whatever it was, still didn't even know where I was going to school because I was a, I was a smart kid, but I neglected to do all the paperwork, this, that, and the other. My mother went to somebody who had a son. She, my mother worked with somebody who had a son to went to St. Bonaventure University. He says, oh, send him up to St. Bonaventure. You have a good time. They, you know, my son goes up there, not telling me the school was 99.9% white. Right, so, right, right. Yeah, I'm coming from the Bronx, right? Birth of hip-hop in those years. There was a place across from Co-op City called The Valley. I swear that's where hip-hop started. There was a guy named, there was KBJ and the Come Off Crew, Timmy Hall, Rocky Buchanan, all of these dudes still doing things now, big, but not in the rap game. Well, Rocky actually is doing the Rap Hall of Fame Museum. So, uh, okay, I, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going up to Olean, New York, seven hours towards Buffalo, right? Right. With a big box, my big afro, and the Commodores playing on my radio, Brick House and all that stuff playing on the radio with a 50 million gold chains on, talking about, yeah, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to play ball with that and the other. I never heard of these dudes. They can't play that. It's a whole other world, Division One basketball in a small town, That's man. Right. That's After right. they win a national title, they damn near had to pick the ticket tape parade the first day. Man. It's like crazy. I'm like, what the hell is this? I'm going from the park to this environment. So it, it, it was really, really a strange thing. Then when I got to meet the ball players, I'm playing with them and they think I'm a recruit. They're like, yo, man, recruit. So, and I'm like, um, doing my thing, not scared of them because we're from New York. You know, I can handle the hell out of the ball, this, that, and the other. Couldn't shoot for a damn, but I can go to the basket and finger roll around your neck and do all this other stuff. And I was a little dude and I could jump a little bit. So I had two or three dunks, not all people, but I, I if we did a layup line, we had a dunk contest. I had my three go-to dunks. I'm right, five right. Ten. 140 pounds, so it looked better when a little guy is doing it. So, you know, stop winning little contests and stuff like that. And so the people on campus think I'm a recruit. Now, I don't, I don't know nothing about it. I, you know, I don't say nothing about it. So it, it was a crazy thing. But after I was scrimmage with these guys on the first day, I go, so what year are you? Freshman. It was about 6'4". I'm like, oh, shit. Then I go to the next one. What year are you? Freshman. Damn. And now I'm starting to get smaller and smaller and smaller. What year are you, freshman? And he's about six eight, and everybody's right. hot diesel, and so I, my dreams were just crushed right there. But I can play. My friends were on the team, so this is the. I'm gonna try to get through this quick, man. So, but my friends are on the team, and what happens is I go to practice every day with them, but I sneak in the arena because practices are closed. This is. NIT champions, we played Syracuse, St. John's, I'm um, excuse me, Syracuse, Georgetown, and all the big schools, right? So they used to close practices. Nobody could go in there. But I had a way, I'm from the Bronx, right? So I had a way where I could keep one of the doors in the arena open. I'd get there like a half hour, hour before practice. I go all the way up to the, the stadium, lay flat on my stomach, and I could see every practice through the chair. And my roommates, which he was a freshman star player, actually named Earl Belcher, second leading scorer in the nation at the time for a freshman. And um, okay. they all knew I was there. So they used to give me signals and stuff. Yo, coach is looking that way, man. Touch your head. Touch, practice is almost over. I'm going to stretch like this. That means start sneaking out and meet us in the dining hall. So I'm watching every practice, man. One day, my sophomore year, a guy breaks his foot, and the coach asked me to come in and, and uh, work out with the team because I was playing JV. Because back then, there used to be the rule you had to play freshman ball or JV or like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. My year, that thing had just ended, but all of the freshmen still played JV and varsity. So here we are on the JV, and I got all of the recruits and me. I'm the starting point guard with all the recruits, which was kind of crazy because just six months ago, I'm in the parks of Co-op City not knowing nothing. So now right. I'm running the point, JV, St. Bonaventure University. So one day, one of the players gets hurt from one of those stories. They call me up, say, come on down. We want you to help work out the team, one of our guys. So I go down and I know all the plays. I'm shooting the passing lane, stealing all the balls, you know, and everything. All because I snuck in and I seen every practice. I knew the plays. I knew the defense. I knew what everybody was going to do. I was cheating the passing lanes, like I said, doing what I had to do. And making right, me right. Like a basketball genius where I was, you know, I cheated. I was sneaking up in the thing. Time went by. 
And finally, to make a long story short, I eventually made the team, earned that uniform, earned a full scholarship, didn't get a whole lot of playing time. But the deal is that it was a dream come true to be able to walk out there be six, 7,000 people, be able to get on those planes, be able to sleep in them fancy hotels, get to see that experience, that whole thing, whatever. And who would have thought it when I didn't, I got cut from Truman High School. And I'm the, probably the first or second player in the history of the school to play Division One basketball and didn't even play. I was the manager. So it's a, it, it all comes full circle. To bring it to now, it's the same thing that happens in business. It parallels business. I get cut in business every day, man. But the fire burns inside you. When I walk in Foot Locker and I see them other companies, and we can talk about them other companies, why Game Over is here and some of them other companies is here. All right? But, um, you know, when I see that, you, it keeps you going. It keeps you persevering. keeps you doing things to the point where we have a line of trophies. We have a line of apparel. We have our own gym, which is incredible. You know, that, that we have our own gym in bed Brooklyn, where I can tell my story and tell – the, the, the value of perseverance, hard work, staying dedicated to your dream, being prepared when an opportunity comes to take advantage of it. And I tell you, St. Bonaventure, by putting me on that team, they weren't going to win one more game. But they knew as a young man, I wasn't going to embarrass them. I was going to go to class. I was going to handle my business. And I was going to do what I had to do. And I was, they were going to be proud of the fact that they gave this dude a uniform and put him on the team and save my moms a whole lot of money. You know, because I don't have to tell you how expensive college is. You know, it's one of those things. So it, it, it was a great experience, but it parallels the business world. And, and the trials and tribulations I go as a black man in an industry that's hell. Because us in the industry, when I got in here, we have no power and we have no presence. And the yeah. things that were done and the things that I've had to go through is just a, a hell of a story. I did a lot of talking now. I'm going to let you ask the question. No, <laughs> no, nah, nah, that, that was cool. But I, I, I definitely wanted to give you the floor because you, mm -hmm. you got to do the, the, the basketball portion of it. But mm -hmm. just to commend you, because I don't know too many people who got cut from their high school team. Mm -hmm. And went to play Division One, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a that's a feat with, within itself. Absolutely. And, and the thing about it now, let's not get it twisted either. I could play back then. Oh no, no, that's <laughs> not. That's, that's not. <laughs> Listen, Jordan got cut as well. So yeah. I tell people all the time, like it don't make a difference uh -huh. how good you were. It it depends, you know, especially how you finished up. You started off that way, but you didn't finish up that way. And yeah. it propelled you to be the man that you came today, that you are today. And, and, and I think the message that I try to get to, like, all the young players that I deal with, because I deal with them from the time they're five, six years old, to the ones that are ready to go in the NBA now. I mean, I got one that I'm talking to now. He's, you know, he's going to get drafted next year and the whole thing. That this game of basketball, you know, it can be a wonderful thing, but it can also be a trap. And it's yeah. a trap for a whole lot of brothers. And it will snuff you out. And, and the things that you have inside you to become successful in this game are the same things that can make you successful in anything that you put your mind to. And, and, and I think we don't understand that because or we need to, as coaches, emphasize that because I have a lot of friends who all they can talk about is what they did 30 years ago. And I'd be like, yeah, my man, but what happened the last 30 years, you know? And I'm not, you know, right. the basketball thing can be a marathon for us instead of a sprint. And we, like, you have a platform now built on basketball. Now, you played the game, you know the game, you use those tools, you build this platform, which, once again, I'm going to tell you, is excellent. Your, your guess, everything you, you do about it is excellent, it's well done. You never know where this is going to go. I saw you picked up a little sponsorship the other day, and I saw that thing because I was going to hit you with that, and we'll talk about that another time. But, oh, but, yeah, um, definitely, definitely, definitely. That's, that's how you do it, man. And, and and, and see, it starts as a kid, but you have to, if you love the game, I like kids to know you can make a living and you can stay in this game forever because the other people do. They stay in this game forever and they get paid while we still talking about what we did on the court 30 years ago. They talking about business and how they can make money off of what they learned 30 years ago and how they can make money off of this game and how they can make money off of you. And we need to be, you know, like I, I had to Google something. I don't want to start trouble. But just imagine everybody listening and you listening. The Harlem Globetrotters, the Harlem Globetrotters are owned by white people. 
the street. Still, I thought I thought the, the black guy bought it and owned it. He don't own it no more. The, the, I just googling it. Something like Hirschfield family or some family or this, that, and the other. But even at any point that they were owned by a, a white family, I think that's kind of crazy. Yeah. First of all, you know when when you look at something like that, the Harlem Globetrotters that was founded in Chicago, right? Yeah. Brought the name the Harlem Globetrotters, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and listen, listen. Uh, I read this book, and it, uh, the name, it's, it's like on the tip of my tongue, but I read this book. Uh, this brother who lives in Harlem, he went to school with mm -hmm. a, friend of, a couple of friends of mine, he went to Westbury. Okay. Right? His father was uh, one of the Harlem Globetrotters. Okay. Right? Aaron something. Huh? Aaron something, right? Because you lent me that book. Yes, I, 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 I lent you all that book. Okay. But anyway, the... The, the 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 point I'm trying to make is the son was writing a letter to the NBA to get the father's pension because mm -hmm. the father had got cut like the last year right before his pension. That's what they said. Wow. Do to a lot of the guys, right? right? Exactly. But what yeah. Abe Saperstein used to do to get the guys to leave college, he would put like four hundred dollars or five hundred dollars at once on the bed, and the guys' eyes would light up. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. they would get us for cheap. And then, just like in slavery, they would sell us to a team that they want, and that team would keep them around for enough to where you're about to get his pension, and then cut them. Well, yeah. Well, you know what? And, and let me say this, like, in the apparel industry, because Game Over started by me having this idea for a line of apparel that athletes would wear when the game was over, but also addressing what athletes would do when the game is over and how it keeps going on and on and on. So it's game over here, but it starts something new, okay? In my journey, um, and, and see, I started at the same time as FUBU and And One and, and all these other companies like that, when right. street urban apparel wear was the hottest thing going. FUBU set it on fire. So everybody was looking for the next FUBU and this, that, and I used to hear, you the next FUBU, you FUBU, that, 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 there's enough for everybody. The meetings that I would have and the things that people would try to do to me and try to convince me to do it my brand. See, I own, I own the term Game Over. I trademarked it in 1994. So any T-shirt you see out there is supposed to be paying me. Anything that says Game Over on is supposed to be paying me. You can't fight every single battle because that's right, that's the right. the attorney. So sometimes I have to say, you know, but the law says that anytime you see anybody infringing on your trademark, you have to at least send notice and have to make an attempt to protect your trademark or it starts to lose its value. So it's a trap. I could spend every dime of profit that I make in court fighting battles with companies that I would never get a dime from or like when the WWE did it to me, they'll drag it out for six, seven years where you yeah, go broke. Yeah. yeah. You know, so there is, it is, it's, um, it's a rig system, man, for a lack of a better term, it's a rig system. If I could get a dime for everybody who printed Game Over on a T-shirt, I'd be rich. But I still have to pay this yeah. attorney to send these letters out and this, that, and the other. I had a thing with the uh, New York Mets last year. You know, um, the, 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 the lawsuit I had with Nike and Google, it is legendary. I mean, what, the battle I went through with Nike. And, um, wow. and I mean, yeah, it's a rough business, and it's a rough business for us. But I've been in some dark rooms and some dark places with some dark dealers, this, that, and the other, from Vegas to flown to Alabama and private jets to cotton companies that wanted to do our T-shirts and stuff like that. And the deals they want to put on the table for you, they put them on it because they think you're stupid. Yep. And, they, and they'll make the money in the big picture. But you'll wind up with maybe a new Jeep and a pair of boots. That's the way we used to say it all the time. Now nah, I'm not selling for a new Jeep and a pair of boots. You know, I want the long money like everybody else gets in this industry. But they don't think we're smart enough to deal like that. So the, the reputation that I got in the garment industry is you can't deal with Eric Hicks because he's difficult. No, you can't deal with Eric Hicks because he's not a sucker. Now, and at the time that I'm turning these deals down, I'm in a house with no furniture, sleeping on the floor. One month the electricity's on, and next month it's off. I'm going back and forth to the gas station, getting diesel fuel to pour in my boiler so that my heat would stay on. I can get it a gallon at a time. People don't know. If you, if you, you know, you learn these things. If you run out of oil in your boiler, it works on the same diesel fuel. That's it. And you don't need that big truck to come over and tell you $300. Right, right. 
you can get enough to get through the night, you know? So, I mean, they, you know, there's just a lot that goes on that you have to deal with unless you want to sell out and then two years later have to get a job. And they'd be like, oh, you on game over. Yeah, well, you know, I got screwed. And, you know, I, you know, now I work in the corner store. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah. we've been able to hold on and things have turned around in the last 10 years or whatever where I'm able to tell these stories and I'm able to, more importantly, help a lot of people. And the Brooklyn Star Dome has made that happen. That's that beautiful gym in the heart of Brooklyn there where I tell these stories to these kids. You know, when I watch them buy these expensive sneakers, and I ain't got nothing against sneakers that are an investment that appreciate value. But if you buy them just to match this outfit for this summer and it's going to be worthless the next day, you don't need to spend $500 on those. Go get yourself a $100 pair of sneakers, even that stretching. But, and and right. let them know it's between things that appreciate value and things that appreciate. Let them know what interest is. We, I, I'm having a, a challenge with a guy right now with the Robin Hood app. Who can make more money? Go start out with hundred dollars. Who can make more money in the Robin Hood app? It's an investment. App. You're going, you're going, you're going in and out. Hold up, hold up for a okay. second. You're going in and out. You're going in and out. Okay. So, How about now? Yeah. I want to make sure. Now? Yeah, I can hear you now. You're going in and out. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, the, somebody from the uh, official Brooklyn Style Dome said the ba the book was called Basketball Slaves. That's the name of that book. Oh, that okay. whole yeah, yeah, that's story. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're saying that, right? We know uh, there's a lot of challenges uh, for us out there, especially uh, people of color uh, with these businesses. But what made you go into this? Right, because okay. I was okay. reluctant. I was reluctant to start this podcast because mm -hmm. when I was coming up, everyone always talked to talked to me about basketball. Right, mm -hmm. always had questions about basketball. I didn't have too many people talk to me about education and what I'm going to do after basketball. Um, and from Whitehead, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, being a star basketball player kind of hurt him after the basketball was over because it was about what he was going to do once the game was over. So this mm -hmm. is some real shit, right? Yeah. So it wasn't until my close friends, you know, was like, yo, G, you need to do this. You always run around the game, always give a good advice. You mentor kids. Mm -hmm. And it's a chance for people to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so after a few of my friends kind of talked me into it, that's where we are today. And mm -hmm. then after seeing uh, Lamar Odom on Drink Champs and not being represented well, because he didn't get to tell a story about how he became Lamar Odom. It was just about the scandal. Okay. You know what I'm saying? All I right, just so had Richie, I just had Richie Parker on here the other night. I was and very we, good. we didn't discuss any about the, mm -hmm. the negative stuff. Because we're right. not here for that. Right. There's right. other platforms, there are other mm -hmm. news stations that you can get that gossip from. We're here right, right. to preserve the stories and the legacies of our black men and women who have come on this platform. Okay, so I'll tell you how we got <clears throat> started. Um, the, the business aspect of it was um, when I was a senior in, in, in college at St. Bonaventure University, I was playing Division One basketball. I was taking 21 credits. I was interning with Southern Tier Legal Services. I owned the, 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 the uh, school had their own newspaper, and I started a little mini version of a newspaper that I owned, and I used to slip under the door with my partner of every student on campus, we slipped it under the door. But we went out to all of the stores in town and got the advertising. So mm. we had a, it was a magazine called Market Wise, and um, it did great. Then we'd sell the cover, the cover paid for everything, and the rest of it was all great. So I was always kind of like into the business thing. Um, fast forward to right before game over, I had a company called Car Search. I love fancy cars, man. I just love fly rides, this, that, and the other. Worked at a dealership on 11th Avenue in Manhattan back when 11th Avenue was the king for that. Fast forward, yeah. driving around in the car. I mean, I'm in the car, I'm late to work, and I was like, I'm not going to go in. I made a U turn, went home. I said, I will never go to work again. I will never go and work for anybody again. The, the automobile industry was racist. I started my own leasing company that just dedicated to our people. So whatever car you wanted, any make or model, I'd deliver it to your doorstep. But if it was a man, it was a bottle of champagne, a woman, it was a dozen roses, plates, this, that, and the other, the whole thing. So learning about trademarks and copyrights and things like that, uh, I wanted to start another business. 
and I and I'm listening to the radio and I hear Teddy Riley, Rex and the Bex. All I want to do is put the zoom, zoom, zoom in the boom, boom, right? Check this out. This uh so I'm like, yeah, I'm thinking about another business and being real complicated. And this dude done made a million dollars saying all I want to do is put the zoom, zoom, zoom in the boom, boom. I'm overthinking it. Keep it simple. Game over. Man with ball ball in one hand, rim in the other, walking away. Game over. That was the start. Man. T-shirts and shorts, selling them out of the trunk of my car. Then I went to Dykeman, Gun Hill, Forest Houses. You name the tournament, I went there and went to the dude and said, listen, what you paying for your T-shirts? All right, I'll beat that price. All I ask is that I can put my logo right there because that's what Nike used to do, put that little switch there. I copied, yeah. mm-hmm. I copied the model. In one summer, actually three summers, I had all the top corners. I was doing something in all the parks from 275 in Brooklyn to West 4th Street to Dykeman to Gun Hill to all over the city. And Game Over became this brand where the New York Knicks hit me up one day and said, Dang, you own all of these tournaments? They thought I own the tournaments. You can't own these tournaments. But no, I don't. But I didn't say nothing. I said, yeah, what do you need? Well, we like you. We want to bring some authenticity to our Knicks summer basketball camp. Can you do the uniforms for us? They were doing uniforms six, 700 at a pop. I was like, yo, yeah, I'm going to do that. And we did it. And then the New York Knicks took on the Game Over trophy. I wound up pitching uh, the Madison Square Garden Network, a television show. A year later, they go, uh, we like the show you have. You know, would you like to do it? And I, I didn't know that you had to do it. I thought you just pitch a show and they pay you and they do it. But I knew if I said that, the deal would die right there. And I was like, oh, yeah, we got a company, GOTV, man. We're ready to go. We can start shooting the ball. This, and the other. Went to Lehman College. Got me some some students to help me with this show. Did 13 episodes of a show based on basketball. And what we did was I created a, a competition called Shake It. Shake It is mm-hmm. where both of these break it. The street term for b- playing ball, balling. The street term for um, uh, break dancing, break it. Where balling meets breaking, you can shake it. You get 60 right. seconds, we put you out at half court. You kick the hottest track. You got to give us all your moves synchronized to the beat in the music. We, we, we scored it like the Olympic floor exercises, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you won, you moved on to the next round, blah, blah, blah. That competition put me on every morning TV show, damn near in America. I was on the Today Show, Good Day New York. I was on Fox four or five times with these kids. Now, these kids were creative, man. They just needed a, a, a forum to express themselves. The moves and stuff were incredible. I videotaped everything, so I still have archives and archives. That's another thing, like, when you did the YouTube talk to me, and I'm looking on videos, I'm like, I got footage I got footage of everybody. You know? I got footage of everybody. So anytime you do hold something. On, hold on, hold on, hold on for a sec. Hold on. I'm going to mm-hmm. cut you off. My man mm-hmm. in the back, the artist who's drawing your picture right now, my man Jamel Powell. Okay. Uh, he said, is that where Nike got their commercials from? Yeah, I was going to get there, but they you were, took it. You know, they were doing the dudes the dancing, yeah, right? Yeah. Dude, that was dude, my claim. Dude, dude, dude. Ooh, that's that was, and, and, what, and what happened is we went to court. And when, I was on Fox Good Day New mm. York. Right? I mean, Good Morning New York. Yeah, no, Good Day New York is Fox. Yeah, and yeah. Um, from what we hear, the advertising agency saw us on there. Next thing you know, that commercial was born. The number one commercial in the history of Nike. That's crazy. With Michael Jordan and everything else, that's still the most popular commercial Nike has <laughs> ever done. Right? That now, whether they got it from me, I claim they did. A whole lot of people are gonna say they did, but let me tell you this. My boy just, I didn't even think about it. My boy just okay. said, yo, they got that got from him. Thank you, my man. Thank you, my man. Let me tell you this. The NBA called me the night that Nike um um played that commercial for the NBA. And somebody very close to the top, you can't get any higher, called me from the NBA to congratulate me. And I said, congratulate me for what? They said, you don't, you didn't see the thing that Nike did? You not in on that? And I said, what did Nike do? So you buy your computer, sit down. And I sat down and I watched this thing. And you know how that one tear comes and rolls down your face? Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. It was like like the, the, the Indian, the Indian now sitting on the train and the dude lit it. And it's the one thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, man. And I mean, three, four years of battled in court and this, that, and the other. And I knew I was going to win. And and you don't need to win. You all I needed to do was get it to the point where uh, it had to go in front of a jury because all the newspaper articles and everything it was a David and Goliath. They'd have a picture of Phil Knight. 
And then a little picture of me, a, little, a small company in Jamaica, New York, blah, 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 blah. And, Wow. Uh, I can't say too much, but we got screwed. But I did get a lot of publicity from it and, you know, did the whole show circuit. And I was still able to build that formula for the kids where my kids performed at halftime in Madison Square Garden. My kids went to NBA All-Star Weekend in Vegas and performed all the way up and down the Vegas Strip at nine, ten years old on somebody else's dime. They got royal treatment, you know, uh, mm. so we got our television show. So we got a lot out of that. But, the, um, you know, that, that was a part. And that was just one of the stories, man. I even got recent stories where these big so, companies huh? stop on and and you know, you came up, you simplified your format. You want to do game over. You got off the net, got off the ball, leaving. Rafty's finished playing. Um, what made you bring it to the community? All right, so and, and, and open up and get into the side dome and all that. Okay, so that you know, doing basketball camps and things like that was never in my business plan. I was an apparel company. I wanted to be the Black Nike. I mean, keeping it real, that's what I wanted to do, because I just thought it was important that our people got to see it. We should be in on this part. Nike does $4 billion a quarter. So when they give people sneakers and this, that, and the other, and we ready to jump through, I'm like, come on, man, $4 billion a quarter? Yeah, give me a break. You're going to give my kids sneakers? Keep your sneakers. Send some laptops, build a school, build a gym, do something for the regular kid, not the elite. Everybody wants the elite, but the regular kid that was me, that everybody at that time said, you wasn't good enough. And that's the kids that we catered to at the gym. Yo, go ahead, the elite can go somewhere else. There's plenty of places for them to go. The elite don't want to pay. So the regular kid, the regular everyday kid that's a good kid that wants to play the game, that's who we catered to. Here's how I got the style. It's way more of them. It's way more of them than they are the elite kid. Thank you. Thank you. And I tell people that all the time. There's no money in chasing the elite. There's no business in no. chasing the elite because they don't want to pay for no. The first thing they want to say is, well, how many pairs of sneakers are you going to give me? How many times are we going to Vegas? How many times are we doing? Where are we staying? Da, da, da. Listen, that's all good. But I'm, I play the long game. I'm trying to prepare you for life. Life ain't going right. to be about you getting everything. That scholarship's going to be over when you're 24, 25 years old. The scholarship is over. I got friends, like I say, and I have to say to them, they're 50, 60 years old. I'd be like, my man, you ain't on scholarship no more. You want a shirt? Buy a shirt. I give you one after you buy one, but then the scholarship is over. You know, so Ted Gustis, right? Ted Gustis, do you, uh, you should have him on your show. You should talk to him. Yeah, we, 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 we're definitely working on that. Clear up your camera a little bit some more. Your camera's oh, okay. up. Yeah, me, me and Rob is definitely working on that right now. Okay, yeah. There you go. You go. So Ted calls me up one day and says, mm -hmm. um, you know, I want you to see this project. Now, me and Ted done did a million projects together. Some good, some not so good, but we did. So I'm like, what do you got for me now, this Ted? Because me and Ted Gustis look like brothers now. He goes, I want you to come meet me in Brooklyn over here. I go, and he shows me this building. And he opens the door, and there's two baskets, no bleachers, no lines on the floor, no nothing, brand new building. He says, this is owned by St. Philip's Christian Church, and they don't know what to do with it. They weren't building it out for public use. It was for the church, a recreational center for the church. By the time the project got, because some of the church guys were ballers, by the time the project got completed, all of these guys have retired, moved to Long Island, whatever, want to play ball anymore. Now they got this building and didn't know what to do with it. I walked in there and I just went, oh my God, this is a dream come true. They don't know what to do with it. Tell them just step aside. I got them. That was eight years ago, man. That building has gone from zero, literally no lines on the floor, no nothing, no bleachers, no nothing, to what it is today, one of the hottest places to play uh, ball, but a uh, beacon in a community where hundreds of kids go through there, where we have a certain philosophy about how we teach basketball, but we teach life. You know, you come in there, it's a zero tolerance when it comes to behavior. There's certain things we just do not tolerate. You're not going to cuss. Your pants are going to be pulled up, this, that, and the other. You're going to be respectful to everybody that comes in. If you can't play by those rules, you got to leave because I'm preparing you for something a lot more than basketball. And uh, been there eight years now. I just signed for another, I think, nine or ten years. And uh, we're going to be there. We, we, we have a thing where we turn no kid away. Okay, so for the kids, the kids that can't aff that can afford it, they paying for the ones that can't. And it's just the way it is, and that's my call, or I'll pay for it. Because nobody's really paying enough 
for what we offer in there. Most of our money is made by renting the place out to the various charter schools and schools and things like that. And then uh, we keep a lot of the time so that we can be something positive in that community. And I've had everybody in there from my main man, Kerry Scurry, has been in there and he's taught me. And I played with Kerry back in the day. That's a whole nother story. When I, I was telling people he wasn't good enough to play with us, which was retarded. But I can't use that word, which was crazy. But because uh, Kerry came in and saved my life and, and added five years to my career, just give him the ball and get out the wow. way. Yeah, Ker- Kerry was an amazing, amazing player, man. really something else. But uh, he comes in, he tells a story, keeps it real. Charles Jones comes in there, you know, Charles Jones. Now, what better guy could you have teaching certain things than a guy that led the nation in scoring twice than Charles Jones? Mike Anderson, you know, uh, from Long Island. Ted Gusson. Ray Haskins comes in there. And trust Roosevelt Bowie. You want to go way back? Roosevelt Bowie's been in there. Anthony Bonham has been in there. I mean, we just keep them coming, and they come in there, and they tell their stories, and they talk, you know, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the game. And, and, and it's important that the kids know that, you know, because, once again, it could be a trap or it could be a beautiful thing that takes you on a magnificent ride and, and, and to places that you never dreamed of, you know? I mean, Game Over literally has taken me around the world. Uh, we've done one-on-one tournaments in Barcelona, Spain, where I get off the plane and we go to the park, and there's Game Over banners and everything else hanging up in the end. Everything the way that I gave them as a blueprint to run this one-on-one tournament, they had the DJ, mm. got caught with the microphone, they had the banners up, the whole thing. And, and you know, it's amazing that those two words have transformed into so much. And uh, but it's all from basketball, and I think our kids need to know that there's so much they can get out of it on the court and behind the scenes, and that goes with the music industry and everything that they do. Don't be so concerned about having to stay in front of the camera or on the court, on the stage. Know that the guy that's making that long money is the guy that's doing the work behind the scenes, the guy that's building arenas, you know, the guy that owns teams, the agents, the lawyers, and this and the other. They're getting paid. And some of them were ball players. And who better to work things in those forums or work things out in those forums than somebody who's played the game? That's right. Well, how, how important is like the mentorship and the coaching that goes on in a game over? It's the most important thing, man, because, I, I, you know, the kids are the future. And, and with some of the things that are set up in our society, I mean, the, the, the odds – uh, you know, I remember, like, I've done a lot of stuff in, in uh, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, excuse me, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, 275. In fact, we mm-hmm. did a camp there where I brought uh, Rolando Blackman and Derek Harper to a camp in Bed-Stuy to do a basketball camp. They were there every day for a week. Uh, uh-huh. those two, yeah, but it's so important, man. And, and, and I say that because when I was in, in 275, I stood there in the gym one day, and I watched all of these kids basically fighting for the same basketball dream. And I was like, unless we do some of these kids don't stand a chance. Man. They don't stand a chance. I mean, we got them in here on basketball, but thank God for the Ray Haskins, the Jockos of the world, man, and, and, and Ted Gustis of the world that see the bigger picture and, and take these kids and realize, okay, we're going to prepare them for something else beyond basketball because we were all just like them. We were all trying to be NBA players, and it was the NBA and bust and this, that, and the other. But somewhere along the line, we said, you know what? We got to be able to take these skills and transfer them into something else and use that same drive and determination to make it in something else and then come back and teach the kids. Because if you notice the people we're talking about that come back and help the kids, a lot of times it's not your NBA player. It's your regular guy that goes out there, becomes successful, and then comes back and does certain things, you know, and to help the community to let these kids know. It was a time when I was sitting in that same spot, dreaming about Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe and everything else and this, that, and the other. Well, I got to be with Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe, but I got to deal with them on a business level. And it was right. crazy to be sitting across the table from Walt Frazier talking about, okay, so how many trophies do you need for your camp? And Earl Monroe, same thing. When he, I, I remember a story where Earl Monroe, the night they retired his number at Madison Square Garden, yeah. When the limousine pulled up at Madison Square Garden, who got out of the back of the limousine? Eric Hicks and Earl Monroe. And for me, that just like blew my mind. When they opened that door, they came to open up the door for Earl and his limo, I stepped out. And yo, Earl, come on, let's go. <clears throat> because we have been doing some business or talking some business things. And, um, you know, it, it's just very, very important for kids to be able to see 
feel and touch. And, and it can't just be me. I have to bring people in. Like, I have to tell people your story. And, yeah, my man, he, you know, he put together his podcast, his Instagram. And he has a show, you know, because what the kids do is they take what you do and they watch us and they take what I do. And then they have the ability to take it to a whole nother level. I may not right. be the next Nike, but some little kid, and I hear it and I get letters, watched me over the last 26 years and said, you know what, uh, Koji, because of you, I started this business. I started that business. That's more than any trophies or anything that I could ever do. You know, uh, I, I, I tell people it, it, certain things that have changed my life. Like the time I was able to call a coach up and say, listen, I got this kid. He can play. He's got no scholarship offers. He's got nothing. And say, is he a good kid? And I say, yeah, he's a good kid. Send him up. We got him. The kid winds up playing four years. They love the kid. Most of his college education is paid for. And that's, um, you know, that's just reaching back, reaching back and doing something tangible and hoping that they pass it on. And that's the only way that we're going to get out of these things, uh, some of the situations that we're in, is when we realize the power that we have economically in the world of sports and the power that we have as individuals that can tell these kids certain things that they need to listen to so they don't make the same mistakes that we make. And they can take things to the next step. Yeah. It's like what Tupac said. He may not be the one that starts a revolution, but may he may spark the mind of the kid who may, you know, definitely start Absolutely. that revolution. So Absolutely. that's what we're here to inspire kids. Um, outside of this, uh, I'm a coach at a high school, a dean, and also have a mentor program called a Sphere of Influence. So okay. that's what I've been busy doing and for us at my give back. But this this came out of out of necessity, you know. It was a time when everybody was locked up in the house, and that's when I kind of started during the quarantine. That's when mm -hmm. all this kind of started. And a friend of mine who uh, has a studio down at Dumbo, he was that last friend that kind of gave that push. He was like, "Yo, what do you think about you know doing a basketball podcast, mm -hmm. preferably high school?" And I said, "I would do it only if I can." interview and bring the the people who had an impact first right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and, and i want to bridge the gap between that that new high school kid and that ray haskins that jerry ash friend you right mm -hmm. and bridge that gap so we can improve you know what's going on in new york city and it's going to start it starts with the books and the athletics but we can pull them in reel them in with the athletics to get them interested in the other things, right? Absolutely. So you got you got to you got to shake that bait there to get them to come, and then once you get them there in that arena, you can kind of shape their minds from there. And Absolutely. what you've been doing, you've been doing exactly that. You know, you know? Well, I could give you an example because I just saw he commented on on here is uh, my man Mike Anderson is the greatest. That's my partner over there at the side, though. Ted Gustis, but Rob Phelps. Now, Rob's my dude. My I God. you told me you interviewed him. Me and Rob go at it. I mean, we go at it because Rob is hardcore. But let me tell you about a program like he has at Bedford, Bedford Academy. You need an 80 average to play. Okay? I, know, you, I always talk about that. That's one of the things I always talk about on the podcast. Yeah. Him and the coach from Banneker. Okay, yeah. 80 absolutely. average. You got to have, you yeah, gotta yeah, have 80 that's average. Right. Yeah. You got to have an 80 average to play. So, And, and he's so strict. And, and let me tell you something. You can be the best player on the team, right? And you show up the day of a game without a tie, you ain't playing. Right. Now, I got to respect that because it's not so much for the basketball. It, what it tells you about rules in other aspects of life as you go further. I come from coaching the AAU when it was bubbling up. It was a team called the Long Island Panthers. Yeah, it was Long Island yep. Panthers. Yeah, yep. Lamar Odom, Gary Charles, yep. and that whole yep. that's my yep. thing that I got. And I didn't want to coach anymore, but a guy by the name of Tyrone Green called me and said, Eric, I need you to coach a team. We just fired somebody. I ain't going to say the name or who we just, they fired because he wanted to be one of my right. best friends. But I replaced him. <clears throat> and uh, so we, there's the Lamar Odoms, the Speedy Classics, the Ron Artest, the this, that, and the other. We had all that. But there was something missing in those programs, and that was – the superstars didn't have to come to practice. I'm old school, man. You don't come to practice, you don't play. It's That's just, right. a, it's not, and, and here was the camel, the story that broke the camel's back. I get a call, and Mateen Cleaves is at the airport, 
and we got a game at ISA tomorrow. And when I pick him up, and oh, by the way, can he stay with you? All right, so I ain't got nothing against the kid. But who's going to sit down for, out of my kids that practice every day with us? Who's going to sit down so that we can fly him in, stay at my house, and 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 uh, so that we can win ISA? And I refuse to do it. I was like, and then from that day, I don't even know if I coached that game. That was it, man. It's like this loyalty. I don't believe in stacking teams. Stacking teams is cool, but when you uh, when you get to life and that team is not stacked and you got to rely on yourself, yeah. I love the kid that can carry a team. I love a kid that carries a team and then he loses. That's okay. That's all right, yeah. man. But you give you give me five of the best players, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, and win. You are supposed to win. You don't even have to be a good coach. Because you got all the good players. Now, give me two good guys and the rest of the guys that will run through a brick wall face. Those are the guys that I was. That was the kid that I was. It sounds like a lot of coaches now uh, in New York City who, you know, but we won't go there. But mm -hmm. what, what, what I <laughs> – let me stop. That's uh, another show. But, but, but it's real. I, I, think, I think you, you, you know, you give those kids a chance and you don't fall into the hype. Like my boy, uh, Chris Williams, he's the assistant coach up at St. Ray's, and I think he's the head freshman coach. Okay. Uh, in 2018, he won Dykeman, right? He okay. won Dykeman with a whole bunch of freshmen and sophomores. He had like one senior on the team. And they beat the undefeated team. I think they were undefeated two years in a row. Mm -hmm. And they beat them in the championship. Not only they beat them in the championship, they had to play a game before the championship game. Okay. The same day. Yep. And I was sitting there protesting with him like, yo, you, you don't have to do that. He was like, yo, it's Nike. They don't want to push it back. Blah, blah, blah. We got to play. Yep. And they wound up winning. And, and, right? and here's, the, here, here's what And happened. he didn't have not one All-American. Yeah. Here's what Malachi. Happened. Malachi was, Malachi, I think, was in 10th grade or freshman. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the kid from my uh, who I was mentor was on that team as well. Here's what happens when you experience that at a young age: you start to realize anything is possible, just from yeah. a little thing like that. It's even like when you play in the playground and they choose up sides, and you look at your guys on your team, and you be like, "Damn, man, we're gonna get blown out, but we're gonna do this." And you win that game, you remember that forever. Had you had the stack team and you just dusted somebody, you get nothing from that. But you take you on an underdog team and you rise because once again, as being a black man or a minority in this culture, you are the underdog, and the team is not stacked in your favor. So you're gonna have to step out there and get it done under any circumstances. And this game can teach you that. And now coaches have the power to teach our kids that if they do the right thing. But if you're doing this to get this player and that player, and he's really 15, but you're getting him at 14. To play, you know, you know, you got him playing at fourteen on and he's really fifteen and this that, and the other. Who are you doing it for? Who you know? So the, the AAU thing had gotten so twisted. Plus the nutty parents. The parents drove me nuts, man. I used to tell my team when I was with the Panthers, I say, listen, I'll cut you because your mom is crazy. I'll cut you because your daddy's crazy. I'm not putting up with it. When you're on the team, that's it. You're not. He's not going to sit behind the bench and yell at me. He's not coming in the locker rooms. This that and the other. I'd rather win or lose without you than have to put up with that all that nonsense. But the AAU game, the behavior from the coaches to the parents to the kids, I sit there and I watch, even in my building, and that's why we don't do a lot of it. I'm like, I can't deal with this, man. I can't even watch this. You know? Look it just I, I, I don't want to put nobody on blast, but uh, I think South Shore won city championship three years in a row. Mm -hmm. No, Nobody won Division One from any of them years. That's right. Yeah. Right? And mm -hmm. look, I, this is not the program we, we're here to call people out, but New York City basketball is in a state of crisis right now. Absolutely. And I don't really think people realize what's going on. We are Absolutely. in a state of crisis from all the money that's being poured into AU programs. Nike don't even have commercials anymore because their commercials are with these grassroots AU programs in every city in America. They don't need to run commercials anymore because the commercials are the tournaments and the summer leagues in every city in America. Right? So they take advantage of it that way. And I use the example of 
big money coming in and destroying things. Kind of what happened with the EBC when the NBA came in and started putting the EBC on television. That would kill you. Mm -hmm. Too much of the money and too much of the exposure and them having their hands on you too much will kill you. And I think that's what's happening right now with New York City basketball. You, you know, before, what, I, before we start off again, I want to give my whoever Dallas seven five nine said thank you for doing the tournament in Staten Island. So I see that, man. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. He is that's well. So that's that's one of the problems I I I have uh, with our high school sports right now because a lot of our guys who are successful are leaving. <laughs> And thank God for, you know, guys like um, Juan Carlos, uh, Malachi, and Khalil Brantley that's mm -hmm. really taking it to the next level. And, of course, you know, we got to mention those schools like uh, Banneker and Bedford Academy. Bedford Academy. Yeah, and, and, and it's so funny. Like, kids have to realize when a kid comes to me for a job, because that's another thing about the Brooklyn Sky Dome, I employ all the kids. I, you, they can get some kind of job. You know what I'm saying? If they can't do our program or whatever, or if you're a kid that's out there lost and, and my guys that I work with get on my case because they think I try to save the world, I'm trying to help everybody and giving away all the money. But you know what? I give them all jobs. Everybody, okay, look, that's your job. This is your job. This is your, and I feel great being able to do it. And there's nothing more powerful. You know, we can take basketball trophies and, and you know, uh, say bottom of it, let them in jackets and things like that. There's nothing more powerful than being able to put a man in a position. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. You're breaking okay, up. Okay. I, I, hey, hey, hey. Hello. Still? Huh? Am I good? Am I good now? All right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Still a little fuzzy. It's a conspiracy, man. They don't want to hear this. That's why they're breaking us up. <laughs> yo, brother. Yo, brother. We right here with that. We right here with that because I'm on that hard. Trust me. <laughs> But I, what I was when, saying, they, when, they, totally, when, you, when you start giving that good information, we start talking about the corporate, you know, beast that's involved. That's right. Something sick, you know, what's happening, man. Because they control these airwaves right here too now. So, but there's that's right. More, that's right. There, there's nothing more powerful than to have somebody come in and I can put them in a position where they can make money and feed their family and take care of their kids. And it's and it's not a lot of money because we're not rich. But if you provide the right. service, I'm going to pay you, and hopefully it helps. And if it's not enough, you got to go somewhere else. But I'm going to do the best that I can. And 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 that's, that's right. everything, man. You know, to be able to put somebody in that position, and the Star Dome has allowed us to be able to do that. So it, it's just been a great thing. And, and like I said, we'll be there another eight years, man, doing our thing, helping kids, helping adults. You know, sometimes what people don't or do understand, a kid will listen to a coach. Before he listened to his parents after a certain age. That's right. Get to thirteen, they don't I, want to I, I experience that all the time. Yeah, yeah, and they'll listen to what I have to say, and and, it, and the kids know if you're giving your parents a hard time, if you're not cleaning your room, you're not taking out the garbage, and all that stuff. Don't think you're gonna come in my gym and play. Oh no, that's right. So we tell the parents if you have a problem with them, let us know. Don't keep it a secret. Don't keep it a secret, man. So we we deal with a lot of that. 